I'm very excited uh, to be here today, uh, especially that uh, Professor Euling is one of my role models, um, and because we both work on water. Uh, and uh, as you know, like was told to you, I am uh, trained as a, an architect, and I'm a practicing architect, and I did my undergraduate degree in civil engineering. And today, I'm going to be uh, uh, speaking to you about the role of safeguarding water in the design of our future cities. And of course, you know, like you might ask, why is it important to safeguard water? Uh, one of the first reasons is that water is a renewable resource. And right now, the world supply of water is being used too fast, and we, it doesn't have enough time to replenish. The second reason is that very often we think we have so much water on Earth. But it's not true, because fresh water, which is the water that we can use to cook, to take showers, to do uh, agriculture, and so forth, is very little. It's only 3% of the amount of water on Earth. And also, among this 3% of uh, fresh water, only 1% is actually uh, readily available. And also, one of the reasons why safeguarding water is extremely important is because we are facing a looming crisis. Uh, in 2025, 2.8 billion people are going to be facing water scarcity and water stress. And in 2050, that number is going to reach 7 billion. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, this crisis is going to hurt mostly the uh, developing world countries. And you, as you can see in this map, the water footprint of, uh, of countries around the world is mostly high, which you can see it in, uh, in dark blue, in uh, North America and in Europe. And actually, water footprint is a very important concept. It is how much is it how we measure uh, the amount of water that a country uses. And very often we, th we think that the water that a country uses, whatever you would take uh, from the lake or from, uh, or, or from the rain and it would come onto your tap water. And that's not true. The amount of water that uh, a, a country uses is all of the water that's needed to support the production of goods and services that, that the inhabitants need. And also, uh, when we look at this graph, which is the amount of fresh water used by the top uh, consumer fresh water in the world, thank God uh, Canada uh, does not make it uh, to the list yet, but it's very close. We notice here, I'm going to see if this is working. Well, it's not working. So actually, you know, I can maybe just point. You can see that China is actually one of the top uh, consumer of, of fresh water resources. And also you can see the list of the other countries. And what's interesting here, what I want you to really see, is that agriculture is the activity that uses most of the fresh water in these countries. And it's something that we don't uh, r realize. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, just something here that I want to point to is the household water. Uh, it uses very little uh, of the whole amount of water used by these countries. And that's the reason why very often uh, politicians, people's engineers, would ignore it. So they would be focusing on agriculture mainly, which makes sense. However, what I would like to stress in my pre presentation today is that that little amount of household water is very important. And in the face of the crisis that, that, that I discussed briefly with you, every single drop of water is going to matter. So therefore, that water use in the household is extremely important. And how do we change it? Well, it's by changing the way that we design our cities, our buildings, and our parks. And I hope that my argument is becoming more clear here. When you see the number of people that live in the city, how much is going to increase? In 2050, 7 out of 10 people on Earth would be li living in cities, and therefore would be needing more and more water. Also, if you see this map, you would see in uh, bright red the, the, the cities that would uh, experience the most growth in the world. What's interesting is that the bright red color uh, co coincide with the dark gray. And the dark gray marks the regions of the world that would experience the, the, the most uh, climate change and desertification, and therefore lack of water. So therefore, uh, a lot of the most important uh, cities in the world today, in, in the future, will experience a water shortage. So, th th in this little uh, diagram that you can see here, I su sum up my, my argument. So mainly because of the urban uh, population is going to grow, because of climate change, and also because uh, water, uh, fresh water resources are depleting, we are forced today to really start thinking about a water smart city. And so you might ask, what is a water, uh, a water smart city? 
Well, uh, it's a city that will uh, integrate I innovative uh, technologies and also a city that would rethink the water infrastructure. What I mean by water infrastructure is the way that water is conveyed all the way to you, to your house. And uh, the way that uh, us uh, in the uh, uh, design field approach it is through different scales because when we approach the design of the city it doesn't just involve where you know kind of a big plan and that's all where we look at uh, many different scales but first of all uh, we can see the scale of the city which is uh, handled by the discipline of urban design and then the scale of the building which is associated with the discipline of architecture and the scale of uh, vegetation which is uh, associated with landscape architecture and finally the scale of the object which is usually um, uh, in industrial design. And how do we design a, a city today? Well, uh, first, we would look at each one of those uh, co components that I just mentioned, and then a designer, um, you know, like with the help of uh, 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 many other experts and politicians, would start to draw the city, the, the, the plan for the city. And it's only after that that we start looking at the water I infrastructure. And, and the water infrastructure is, you know, like uh, as we know it today, well, it's, uh, uh, water is gathered from lakes uh, or uh, from rainwater, and, uh, and then it's being treated, then it's being uh, conveyed in pipes, and then uh, you do have it in your house. Well, um, that's, uh, you know, like what's happening today, and where uh, will your waste go? Well, again, it will be taken uh, with a pipe, and it's going to be taken to a sewage uh, treatment plant. And then the water, again, is just wasted most of the time. The new approach that I would like to share with you today is one where the water infrastructure becomes one with the city. And what I mean by that is that, you know, all of the different components of the city that you see today, that you experience, such as streets, buildings, parks, and so forth, would start to collect water and treat water um, exactly at the same spot. And why this model is important is because it is more resilient. Uh, who knows what the word uh, resilient means? Here, yes? Lasting? Uh, not really. Um, <laughs> maybe some other try? Yes, please? Strong? Yes, yes? Against? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, like those two last uh, answers were correct. A resilient model is one that can re resist stress and changes, the one that can adapt. And right now, the model that we have, which is a centralized model where, where all the water would go to one place, be treated in one place, and then uh, would be sent back, is not resilient at all. If one problem occur, then suddenly we don't have water anymore. And of course, one of the key components also in, in this model is that we're going to try to be as efficient as possible. Since we're going to be having less and less, less water available in the future, why not try to recycle this water and reuse it as much as possible? And uh, the best metaphors that I've found to explain to you this model is one of uh, symbiosis in the animal world. So who knows the function of the uh, ramora fish to the shark? Who can tell me? Or the tick bird with the rhinoceros? Yes? Yes. So uh, wh what this means is that, the, that you have a mutually beneficial relationship between the two animals. And the same way, wh what I would like to propose is that the water infrastructure of our cities would benefit the city itself and then vice versa. The, the design of the buildings and of our parks and so forth could help us be more efficient with water. Um, so uh, before I would get into uh, examples of this uh, new model of, of city planning that would safeguard water, just wanted uh, to, to share with you a, a small story. So what got me interested in water? I mean, as you know, I am an uh, architect. Why the hell did I start being in interested in water? Well, uh, all started, oh, I was going to fall, sorry. <laughs> uh, so all started when I got a grant from Harvard University when I finished my master. And uh, in that, w with that grant, it was a, a traveling fellowship. I was able to travel all, uh, all throughout the Sahara. And my, uh, my focus of research was to look at uh, ecotourism, the architecture of ecotourism. And when I traveled across the Sahara, I noticed that those, uh, uh, very, very often those hotels had very little wa water to work with. But because they had to uh, house you know, uh, uh, foreigners, they had to uh, get them some certain level of comfort. And so I did find that very simple means, this very simple means that they were using, were actually very, very smart. And, and I was 
able, able to learn from them a lot. And, and so this is one of the uh, views in, in, the south of, uh, in the south of Morocco, in the Sahara of Morocco, where you can see that the, uh, that the architecture and the landscape that you see and the water are really working uh, in symbiosis with one another. And here is an image that I wanted to share with you with a small hut. Who can tell me what that hut is? What is that hut for? Almost there, yes? No, yes? No, who can tell, yes? No, it was my shower. <laughs> and it was just a small hut and I was uh, given a bucket every two days of three liters of water. And at the beginning I said, oh my God, I'm gonna be so dirty and I'm gonna be so sweaty, I'm gonna smell bad, it's uh, so little water. And I was told, sorry, that's all you're gonna get. And actually it was the best shower I've ever taken. It was amazing. I was in that small hut and light was, uh, uh, was coming across. I was in, 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 on top of a little wooden platform. I, I was really saving, I was really learning how to take a shower with three liters of water. And I can tell you, I've never felt so clean. And when I came back to Toronto, I started doing a little bit of calculation. What did I find? If I was living in the Sahara for a whole year, I'm gonna be using 432 liters a year. And here in Toronto, to take a 15-minute shower, I was shocked, 72,000 liters a year. It's 160 times more. Anyhow, so that was just you know, a short break to just explain to you why I got interested in water and how I was shocked that we were wasting so much water here in Canada and North America. So right now, I'm gonna just uh, share with you some uh, examples that are part of my research with one of my colleagues uh, at the uh, University of Toronto, where we have looked all around at best practice examples. What are uh, you know projects, either real or uh, or speculative, that are thinking ahead, that are thinking outside of the box, that are thinking that tomorrow we're going to have less water, and how can we design uh, our buildings, parks, and cities with that in mind? So I'm going to start with small and all the way to large. Uh, one example for a small is uh, this uh, device. Who can guess what this is? Yes? No, but it's, uh, you're almost there. It's called the liquid trap. So it's basically a pouch. It's very, very simple to make. And uh, it is based on uh, the fact that the way that it is designed in those very small channels, that the surface of water that's facing the light is being maximized. And maybe you can understand it better here. So uh, uh, it is made uh, for countries uh, in, in the developing world where you have to walk for a very long distance to get your water. So you, so you would usually go to a truck and you would uh, fill in the uh, uh, liquid trap device and then you would wear it and you will walk. And exactly in midday, in a walk of uh, 30 minutes, the water would be purified. And, um, you know, like for a device, so usually the way it would work, people would use a bucket, put water in it, and then would walk, and the water would get even more uh, contaminated during the walk. So anyway, so this is a small-scale device that just shows you that with very simple techniques, using UV lights, you can purify water. And one other uh, project that I find very interesting that use uh, biomimetic and that gets inspired for how the the cactus plant lives in the desert and extract water from the desert is the vena device. So you can see it, it's on the right hand side. The way that it works, I'm gonna try to make it short, but it's uh, made out of uh, copper fi filaments, which are, I'm gonna see if this is working. No, well, sorry. So you can see it, it, it's at the center of the device, copper filaments that are then linked all the way down uh, to a well uh, underground. And the way that it's work is it works is that the, uh, the copper filament actually can transmit uh, temperature very fast. So the temperature uh, differential that happens uh, at the top is when air would pass through the device, the vena, the, um, the, the, the temperature uh, of the copper filament is lower. So w that would induce water condensation. So at the end, that water that's being collected on the filament is stored at the bottom of the well. And you, as you can see here on the left-hand side, how Vina can be used in a city like Yemen, and how nice it can actually, uh, it can become part of the uh, urban furniture. So as you can see here, it can be uh, coupled with benches and so forth. And so at the same time, it collects water and then can serve uh, a secondary function. Another project here that was made by a friend of mine that I commissioned to work on uh, this topic of the lack of water, I asked him what would he, 
uh, how can he imagine the future without water? Well, the way that he did imagine it is that if we wear a suit, that basically that suit, the, the images that you see all around are uh, describing the function of that suit. And so all of our pee and poo will be transformed and then we're gonna extract water from it again and then we're gonna drink it. Anyways, uh, uh, this is a speculative project, but if we don't have water in the future, why not? I don't know if you guys saw the mo uh, movie Dune by David Lynch. If you haven't, you should see it because this, um, this project is, uh, is inspired by it. And the, in that movie Dune, uh, we see uh, a future with no water. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to show, you know, like one last, uh, one, one last project here, which is the, uh, the suburban home, you know, like uh, right now, the way that we uh, that we see homes uh, in the suburbs is a home with a front yard and then a backyard. Well, in this project, the the uh, uh, the architect reimagined the suburban home as being broken and also into four pieces. And why you would ask me? Well, so that the integration with, with the garden and the house would be uh, w uh, w would be done very well and that all those gardens that you see, they're called bio uh, digesters. And so all of the wastewater uh, uh, from the house is being treated, and, then, and, and that uh, wetland gardens are also serve as a landscape for your garden. And I just wanna end with this photo. So your uh, regular basement, that's usually very dark. Here you can see if we put uh, a glass in the basement that would look into those uh, gardens that would break down the bacteria in the wastewater. This is the type of experience that you would get in the house of the future. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much.